Hi everyone, Whitney Lowe here and welcome to another of our Clinical Insights videos where today we're going to be talking about thoracic outlet syndrome. This is a condition that has a, I don't know, a fair amount of ambiguity to it because it's not defined really consistently in a lot of the research literature and there's some confusion about exactly what is involved, what's causing the problem, where the locations are where those problems are occurring and that leads to some confusion about what can really be done about it. This condition is actually something that because of all this confusion there's been a fair amount of um, debate about if it really even exists or not and I think part of that comes from the difficulty of accurately identifying what the nature of the problem is. So let's go over and take a look at what some of those factors are that play a role in what thoracic outlet syndrome is and how we may address that as a manual therapist. So the first place we're going to start is talking about what the thoracic outlet actually is and this is one of the first places where some of the ambiguity begins. In general, we can talk about this region right here predominantly as the thoracic outlet. So it's a pretty large area and it's not really terribly specific, but in general, the term comes from the fact that we have structures that are exiting the thoracic rib cage here, such as the uh, aorta blending into and splitting into the subclavian artery right here. And we have respiratory structures that are coming down into, you know, the windpipe coming down into the thoracic rib cage. But those that are exiting out the top here, this is where the name thoracic outlet comes from. Now, when we talk about thoracic outlet syndrome, we are talking potentially about three different types of tissues that might be involved. And we've got to zero in on them a little bit here. So let's just take a, a little bit closer look at what we're dealing with. If we zoom in, we can see there are veins here. So we've got venous structures potentially susceptible to compression pathologies in this area. Arterial structures, we have mentioned the subclavian artery and some of the other branches that are right around here. And we also have nerves coming through here. So we have three different types of tissues that might be potentially compressed and involved in here. So we call this the first one neurogenic. That would be ones that are being generated by the nervous system. So mainly we're talking about the brachial plexus and its branches right here. We have arterial, which is of course going to be associated with the arteries that are in this region, mainly the subclavian artery and its branches. And then also venous as another option. So those three types of compression or three different types of thoracic outlet syndrome are the main things that we're going to be looking at as a causative factor. Now, some of the research literature is a, a bit amb uh, ambiguous about which one of those is really involved and what the primary symptoms are, but close to about, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the conditions of thoracic outlet syndrome report with neurological sensations. So most of the condition, most of the problems we really sort of put them into that neurogenic category. Now, it is quite possible you might have both things occurring at the same time. You might have arterial compression and venous compression and neurological compression, all three of them, in fact, at the same time. So the point is, it's not so critical that we establish if there's only one or more than one. Just assume we might have at least one and maybe more. Primary symptoms that you're going to see occurring from this, if it's a neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, those are going to be neurological sensations like pins and needles, numbness sensations, mostly felt in the distal upper extremity. And because of the way the nerves branch down here, the majority of those symptoms tend to occur in the ulnar nerve distribution of the hand. Here's an image of the hand and the area which is innervated by the ulnar nerve. So when we have one of those neurogenic versions of thoracic outlet syndrome, it's pretty common to have those sensations felt in the ulnar edge of the hand into the pinky finger as the predominant symptom pattern. If it's arterial compression, then we might have some uh, degree of coldness in the upper extremity because of lack of circulation to the full upper extremity. Sometimes this also produces some of the pins and needles or paresthesia sensation because it irritates the nerves which are not getting a full and adequate blood supply. Those are possible uh, causes in there. We also may have some other things that are happening from venous compression, such as discoloration because of a blockage of venous return. So there may be some color changes in the upper extremity as a result of that as well. So these are all possible things that might come up as signs and symptoms from those different variations of compression for the thoracic outlet structures. Now, the next thing that we're going to look at is where the compression might be occurring. And there's four different variations on where we might see those compression factors occurring of either 
nerves, arteries, or veins. So the first variation that we're going to talk about is something called a cervical rib. And a cervical rib is actually sort of a pathological extension of the transverse process of the C7 vertebra. Here's our C7 vertebra right here, and this is its transverse process. And there's a bony growth that comes out and curves around and attaches just like this. And it usually attaches to the first rib somewhere down here about like that. Now, this is not present in everybody. In fact, a very small percentage of the population, usually about less than 2% of the population have this cervical rib. But if they do have the cervical rib there, this is something from, you know, important to keep in mind as the manual therapist. If you're working on people's musculature in this area, like working on their scalene muscles, you might feel something under your fingers right down here that's very hard and unyielding and think it's like really tight muscles or something like that. And it may in fact be this bony extension of this transverse process in here. Now, if we notice its position here and then we put those nervous structures back on, we can see the potential for them being compressed. Now, this is actually inaccurate because generally the nerves go over the top of that cervical rib and not underneath it, but they won't do that in this particular diagram here. So they'll go over the top of that cervical rib and that causes a degree of compression or bowstringing of that nerve against the cervical rib. And that's one of our potential causes for neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. The next variation is called anterior scalene syndrome sometimes instead of just thoracic outlet syndrome, which I like that term because it's actually a bit more specific about where the problem is. You can see here how the brachial plexus, the nerves are going in between the anterior and middle scalene muscles. And let's add our arteries back on here as well. Again, you can see they're also passing through this area and may potentially get compressed between the anterior and middle scalenes. Now, interestingly enough, the main vein, venous structures around here don't pass in between the anterior and middle scalene muscles. Let me tip that down a little bit so we can see. So they're sort of immune from this particular variation because they're outside that scalene triangle there. So do note that there is potential problem of the anterior scalene muscles compressing the nerves and arteries in this particular region, but the veins are not necessarily susceptible to it in this area. If we move down just a little bit, we can then see the next location of potential problem is compression underneath the clavicle against the first rib. You can see there's not a lot of space right here, and so it's, it's pretty easy to see how those structures might get potentially compressed underneath this clavicle against the first rib. And this is sometimes referred to as costoclavicular compression or costoclavicular syndrome. Again, it's a name that's a little bit more specific than thoracic outlet syndrome because it actually identifies where the problem is occurring. We have one last location where we might see some of that problem occurring, and that involves the pectoralis minor muscle. So here's our pectoralis minor muscle located right here. Let's just highlight that so we can zero in on that for a moment. We see that pectoralis minor, and then notice that we have the arteries running underneath it, the nerves running underneath it, but also a split in the veins right there. So there may be some venous compression of the by the pectoralis minor, but there also may be some of it that is not affected because this branch up here that we see is running up above the pectoralis minor. So we have these four different potential locations where we might have problems. All of them may potentially be considered thoracic outlet syndrome. So this is something to keep in mind if you have a client that has symptoms of coldness, tingling, pins and needles in the upper extremity, and any of those things that are aggravated with certain motions that might compress those structures either in the cervical region or here in the shoulder, they may be potential concerns to watch for. We delve into this in a much greater detail in our cervical course. So come on over to the Academy of Clinical Massage and take a look at those courses over there. And we can go into a lot greater depth about how to identify and assess those different variations of thoracic outlet syndrome. And then, of course, also, how would you go about treating them? What are the best treatment strategies to address them? So again, come join us there, academyofclinicalmassage.com. We'd love to have you join us, and we'll see you in the next video.